Welcome to the Earthworks Podcast, where our team will share the jargon of carbon from many of our turf friends from the past 30 years. Hi, everybody. I'm Joel Simmons, and this is the Earthworks Podcast. I'm very excited to have an old friend, Mr. Chad Adcock, who is the Vice President of Sod Production Services today, but he did spend some time growing grass in his youth, and we'll talk a little bit about that. I think I met you, you I must have met you at Kinlock, uh, when you because I was there at the time, and you were doing all the amendments, and everybody was yelling at me because they all came in separate bags, and that's the last time we ever did amendments in separate bags, but you and Pete went, and uh, and we just talked to Adam Miller not too long ago, and, and this whole story came up then, but you were there, you were actually there th through construction, right? Yes, sir. We, I remember putting out all those bags on every green and <laughs> sorry. All in and, <laughs> and then and then somebody said to me, Hey, is it possible to uh yeah, that's right. Turn off your phone there, bud. I know you're a very important man. Uh, but is it possible that you could take all these amendments and put them into one bag? And I kind of realized, oh, that would be pretty simple. And 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 still to this day, Pete um kind of curses me because uh and we just did a lot of construction amendment at Congressional, but uh, but you were there through that grow, and that was quite the property. I mean, it still is quite the property, but you know, it's still to this day one of my favorite places, favorite experiences. You guys had a phenomenal team during growing, and it continued for ten years, you know, after. And uh, but those were some great years in my mind. Anyway, I don't know how you felt about it. Oh, that was an awesome place. I loved yeah. it. Learned so much there from Pete and all the other assistants that came through there. You know, we learned from each other. It was awesome. Yeah, you, you had some, there was just great guys. And of course, I remember, uh, what was it called? The Red Hawk? Uh, the Red Oak. Red Oak, sorry. I always got that wrong. The Red Oak was this little, I mean, back in the day, Kinlock was like a million miles away from Richmond and, you know, it was out in the boonies. And now, of course, the boonies have, have, have become a suburbia. And, uh, but, you know, I remember, you know, every time I went down there, I spent a couple of days at a stretch with you guys, it would always end up at the Red Oak. Um, yeah, there was a few days at the Red Oak, especially yeah. rainy days and things like that. If if anybody's uh, uh, watching us on YouTube, Chad is sitting in his bar right now, which is kind of a neat picture. And I'm very jealous. It's a very nice setup. So talk, talk, let's talk a little bit about Kinlock. You were there, uh, you just described it as you got there when it was nothing but mud. Yeah, I got there in uh, January of 2010, uh, let's see, 2000, 2000. Yeah. 2000. January 2000, and it was just bucket of mud at that point. Yeah. And uh, getting shaped out, the front nine was roughly shaped out. They were starting to do irrigation on the back. So what, what was the property like that, that virgin? I mean, how, how was it all trees? Or was, it was all forest? No, they had cleared it out. All the, you know, the um, corridors were cleared. You know, it was just, uh, they were kind of rough shaping all the dirt at that point. But they had to move a lot of trees. I mean, they had to cut a lot of trees down to cut those corridors, I'm assuming. That was all woods, I think, when they bought the property. Is that right? Do you remember? Yes. Yep. So they did a lot of that kind of stuff. And the pond was man-made or was the is the lake, uh, was that there? It was a 70-acre man-made lake. That, that that lake had been there for, pro I don't know, maybe 15 years before I got there. Because it had some big bass in it, you know. Oh, really? <laughs> of course. So you oh, remember that part? <laughs> yeah, already. Yeah, we used to sit out there and fish a little bit at night. That's a great place to fish. I mean, it's a great little property. Uh, but it's but the neat thing, and we were just talking about this with Adam Miller. Uh, I mean, there you are in Richmond, Virginia, growing in a full blown bent grass golf course, which really, if you think about it, is nuts. Things and, they didn't think we could do back then. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And we're going to talk about it because really, what you're doing now at uh, Sod Productions is is working with. Uh, one of the more popular uh, Bermuda grasses, Tahoma. But imagine if, uh, you know, if that place had not been bent grass, what it would be today. I mean, it's, you know, it's such a special place and they've maintained it. I mean, Pete certainly did. And, you know, and it's been maintained all those years as a bent grass property, which is not an easy thing to do in Richmond, Virginia. No, it's, t it's, it's insane, but, you know, we do it, the fungicides we have now, the fertilizers, you know, yeah. The uh, organic approach that you guys do there at Earthworks, all of that uh, lends itself to, you know, making that property great. Yeah, it was it was pretty. And, you know, it's funny because I use um, I have a profile picture of that, uh, of, of one of the greens and uh, I use it as an example. Uh, and it's a profile of about three or four inches of organic matter. And I use it as 
the uh, the step, you know, the the poster child for, uh, you know, is this good organic matter or is it not? And when you look at the profile, uh, it's a it's very clean. It's it's a lot of sand top dressing, a lot of sand through it. There's no layers. And at the very bottom of the profile, you can see a massive amount of roots. I mean, those roots were deep and and. Uh, you know, and we're and I and I know talking to you guys at the property as the years went on and we were building this humus, it changed some of the water management. But Pete was pretty much a stickler for water anyway. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. always very, very dry, you know. Yeah, which is good. I mean, it's dry. and, uh, you know, I if I remember right, and I, Pete would probably shoot me because I don't remember, but I am pretty sure those greens were were had no organic in them from the start. You know, I don't remember that either. Now that you say that, I, you know, it's fine. I think you're right. As a matter of fact, I recall a time when I was, uh, I think Lester George came up to Robert Trent Jones and Pete and Glenn Smickley and I uh, were trying to talk him, uh, you know, about pulling Pete out. Uh, and, um, and, and, you know, and, and the conversation, and of course, Lester was going to make that decision, but it became an issue of, how, well, how much does Pete Moss cost? And how much is the amendment package you're proposing cost? It was substantially less than, you know, 20% Pete Moss. Uh, but it was, um, you know, and, and it was one of the first courses that I worked on that uh, had no peat Moss in it, if I'm correct, and, and, and you're correct as well. Uh, I don't know that I would recommend that today. I mean, for if for no other reason than insurance, throwing 5-10% peat Moss isn't going to hurt. But, you know, it's funny, I've seen so many profilers where you take a profile of a peat, you know, 10, 20% peat, and it's all migrated, maybe into little softballs or into layers, but the peat's not doing what some of the uh, better organic amendments are doing. So yeah, I will say for the record, and I might be wrong too, Pete, sorry, uh, that that was one of the first properties that I worked on that they did zero uh, peat, and they put a lot of amendments. And you guys flipped it all in bag by bag with a rhododarian, right? Exactly. We did it all with a rhododarian or, you know, a version of a rhododarian and tilled it all in and, you know, <laughs> we're in over. So we had to float those greens twice. They landscapes came in and floated that floated yeah. everything and got it perfect. And then we went in there and amended Messed all, it all up, tilled it all in. And, and then they came back in and refloated it. Yeah. And so that was an interesting, and every now and then they needed a little bit of extra, you know, they didn't have quite enough or something. They shifted it around. Yeah. How many, how many times was my name used in vain while you guys were having to flip all that crap into those greens? Oh, we, we cussed you a whole bunch. <laughs> Thank you very much. I felt it from a distance. You know that, right? There was, uh, yeah. yeah, there was a lot of pain going on my shoulders. A guy named Billy Bobbitt who might listen to this and Ryan. Yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of cursing going on with my name attached to it, I'm sure. But but hell, you know, they uh, they really worked out well, and it's still to this day. That's the neat thing about doing it right is that even 20 years later, they still hold up. And you know, and it's just it's just an amazing golf course. And if anybody ever gets a chance to get to Richmond, Virginia, and uh, get a chance to go visit Kinlock, it's worth worth the time. And it's a great golf course to play. I mean, it's it's very playable and a lot of fun. So a, you left. You left. You'll ever excuse me. Say again. I said it's one of the best conditioned golf courses yeah. anybody will ever see. And it's a great venue and it's a great location too. So so you bounced around a little bit. You left Kinlock and uh, went up to um, Cannon Ridge. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. In, in Virginia? Uh, probably June or July of 2003, I went up to uh, Fredericksburg. So let me, let me go back before I get back to Cannon Ridge. But you're, you're, and I didn't know this until we just started talking. You're a Mississippi State grad. I am. Yeah. Turf grass? Turf grass, yep. Golf and sports turf management. So you were military and you got this, uh, we paid for you to be a golf course superintendent on, on the GI Bill, which is, uh, I think, a great thing. Yep, that's uh, right. Louis, Louisiana boy by, uh, where in Louisiana? By uh, by birth? West Monroe. West oh, Monroe. wow. Okay, very nice. But you said something about you were out in California. I guess that was in the service. And then you just, that's where you got a, fell in there. love. I was a Marine out there and I really just kind of fell in love with golf and um, the, I guess the rest is history. Somebody told me about the, Hey, you can do this as a career. And I said, no, no there's no way you can do this as a career. This has <laughs> got like volunteer stuff, you know, back then, but I was only 20 something years old. And, and, uh, they told me about Mississippi state at that time, there was like three or four or five really good schools, Penn state, um, Michigan state, Mississippi state, Michigan, Rutgers, state, uh, Rutgers. Yeah. Maybe, uh, New Mexico state, I think. But I, I'm not sure back back then that's what I had to choose from, you know. 
Does Mississippi State even have a uh, turf grass program anymore? Do you know? They do. Yeah. Oh, good. Good. Yeah. We we need uh, we need more people in the business. So whoever's listening, encourage your neighbors, your kids, your brothers and sisters. We need people back in the business. It's kind of crazy. So you go up to uh, Fredericksburg. Yes, sir. Uh, big change. Big change. Yep. On yeah. my own at that at that point in time. It's a great property. It was uh, a property. It was right on the Rappahannock River overlooking uh, where the Union Army was staged uh, back in the Civil War and the Confederates were on one side of the Rappahannock River and we were, you know, the Union Oh, you're right there on that river. Yeah, they had the um, the earthworks where they had all the cannons and stuff placed and that was such a great property and uh, unfortunately it didn't pan out. You know, it, it was in a rough area on, I guess, yeah. I-95, but it was a great golf course for for at least 10 years. Who was the architect there? Do you remember? That was Bobby Weed. It was Bobby Weed. Okay. I wasn't sure who did that. Bobby Weed and Dean Beeman. Dean Dean contributed and Bobby kind of did all the, mm. the the elbow grease stuff. Then you go up to uh, TPC in Washington, right in the heart of the uh, transition zone. Um, grass is up there. We're all uh, cool season. Yep. Everything was cool season there. What was the grass at Canyon Ridge? I was all cool season. So you didn't have any growing experience in, in warm season grass? No. No, than... I didn't say I didn't know that. And we're oh. gonna talk about warm season grass here in a minute, but uh uh but you didn't you didn't so you didn't uh go cut your teeth on that. You know, it's funny, I, I was talking about this recently, uh and, and you might be a good person to talk to about this, having worked cool season and now obviously focusing on on Tahoma and, and warm season grasses. But uh, a dear friend of mine goes to a job interview having cool season grass in a transition zone to a, a market that uh, was using, you know, I don't know if it was uh, uh, one of the newer ones. I don't know what the grass was, but it was a Bermuda grass, you know, one of the newer varieties of Bermuda on the fair on the uh, greens. And, and he felt that he lost the job because he didn't have warm season experience. He came from a transition zone. Uh, so the environment was actually, it wasn't even that far from where he was uh, living currently. But the one thing that knocked him back a little bit was that he didn't have experience growing a warm season grass. Uh, does that make sense? I mean, you, you're pretty familiar with the warm season grasses now. I would think in a transition zone, Bermuda, growing Bermuda and keeping it alive like you did at Kinlock and at Canyon Ridge and even at TPC in the transition zone, that's got to be pretty damn hard. It is. And I don't think it's too far of a stretch for, you know, I know I get why people, um, they look at that as a negative, you know, when somebody doesn't have an experience uh, with something, they're going to use that against them. But um, if you can grow cool season grass in the mid Atlantic, if you can grow bent grass and in, in uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia, or you can do warm season anywhere yeah. well yeah I, i've always contended if you can grow cool season grass in mid-atlantic or even in any of the transition zones even in that you know uh st louis in that you know, area area down there if you can grow grass in those environments you can grow grass anywhere and on any, any conditions assuming you have some knowledge of soils and and how to manage a soil but you know i i find that entertaining so you go up to tpc and you work in washington dc and and uh pretty high profile lots of stuff going on um, you know, luckily you're part of this RTJ network, but, uh, uh, how, how was that change culturally from where you came from? I mean, it had to be a little bit different. The TPC was a de uh, definitely, uh, a different mindset, I guess, you know, a lot of, a lot of moving parts and a lot of paperwork and things like that, that I had to adjust to, um, you had to, you had to, um, uh, report to a lot of uh, folks I'm sure in that yeah network. definitely had a lot of people above me a lot of you know a lot of eyes on the prize basically and uh, you know we did that renovation there and it was a successful renovation it was yeah really yeah it's a neat property as well and uh, actually now one of Pete's Pete Wentz uh, former assistants is now managing uh, TPC or their Ryan Higgins so uh, we mm -hmm. wish him obviously the very best of luck um that, I guess that was it was TPC where you were when uh, when we made that jaunt over to uh, Scotland or to Ireland. Yeah, is that where you were? Okay, we had two thousand nine. Yeah, was it two thousand nine? I thought it was earlier then, but was it two thousand nine? The economy was horrible. Yeah. yeah, 
diesel was like six bucks or something back then. Yeah, unlike now, right? Yeah. Uh, it's probably worse then, I guess. There was this, there was a stretch that was pretty bad. Yeah. That, I mean, we forgot a lot about that, but uh, it was interesting because we all, we, there was a whole group of us that went and we all came from different places. I don't know if you were one of the ones that missed the boat. Uh, there was a couple people that missed their flight. <laughs> no, I, I kept my flight. You you made it and, and got in yeah. on that. And then we uh, got into a bus with uh, with a whole bunch of guys uh, and uh, played a bunch of golf in the rain. And yeah. uh, and like I was telling you earlier, I think one of those rainy dates, I actually hit the caddy with one of my bad drives. So it was uh, rather embarrassing for me, but it was a great experience. And and uh, I think everybody had a lot of fun, but and I recommend it, needless to say. So anyway, let's talk about and what I really wanted to get you on and to talk about is what you're doing now. You are uh, talk a little bit about what, you know, uh, the business is and, 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 and you know, sod production services uh, and, and then ultimately we'll get into Tahoma. But give me a background as to what the company is and, and what your role is in within that. So Side Production Services is a DBA. It's owned by uh, Riverside Turf or Riverside Turf um, LLC out of Charles City, Virginia. Um, that company is owned by the Hula family. So that's who I work for. And so we initially are a uh, local distributor of Sod. We, we distribute uh, fescue, bluegrass. Uh, we have several different types of Bermuda, uh, several different types of zoysia grass. And we're local in Virginia, we go all the way up from Northern Virginia to the Western Virginia and cover the Eastern region as well. So we, we're basically statewide. In sod production in as sod, a sod supplier. Sod production, yep. Yeah. And we okay. do sports fields and we do golf courses. And then uh, sod production services is the licensing and marketing arm for proprietary Bermuda grasses like Tahoma and other Are ones. there other ones that you guys have? Uh, we have other ones, but not in sod production services. Only Tahoma right now. We've got okay. we've got grasses in the works with some of the universities that we're trying to get. I would think so. Yeah. So yeah. are you? So you came into there uh, out of a couple uh, stints in golf. Uh, were you growing sod at any point, or have you always been in the role that you're in? I've always been in this role. Yeah. Okay. But you guys are producing sod. So if a golf is, uh, is it more sports turf or is it more golf? It's a little bit of everything. I'd say we're more golf right now. Oh, are um, you? Okay. I see you at the, uh, I, well, I just saw you last week at the uh, SFMA, the the uh, uh, sports turf uh, trade show out in Salt Lake. So I, I, and I think I always see you at a sports turf conference. So I, I assume there's a lot of sports turf. Of course, you were rubbing elbows with Mr. Toma. So I had to leave you alone because I knew how important you were, but I oh. wanted to make sure that uh, you didn't, I didn't interrupt. Uh, but <clears throat> so, uh, but they are, uh, so Riverside Turf is the parent company is, or am I backwards? No, no, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk. I mean, what I really wanted to bring you on about is I happen to see a lot of Tahoma and I think it's a wonderful grass and I think it's, um, I think it's something growing. I mean, some of these, let, let's talk in general terms first on, on these newer uh, Bermuda grasses. I mean, there's Tahoma and Northbridge and Tiff Tough and Iron Cutter. You're seeing them all over the place. It seems like all of the sudden we've got this explosion of varieties of, uh, of Bermuda, these um, ultra dwarf, uh, are we even calling them ultra dwarfs anymore? What are we calling them? No, no, no. These, these are not ultra dwarfs. These no, are... I didn't think so. These are Bermuda grasses, regular standard Bermuda grasses. But what the uh, the USDA, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, they teamed up with the United States Golf Associate, so wow. got the USDA, the USGA, they contributed uh, funds to the universities in a breeding program probably 10, 15 years ago. And they continue to do that to this day under different breeding programs. Uh, with different universities across the, the United States. And they're trying to develop uh, very drought tolerant Bermuda grasses and very cold tolerant Bermuda grasses. And so that is where some of these newer varieties are coming from, like Tiff Tough. Tiff Tough came out of Georgia out of that breeding program um, when they were really trying to, you know, get a yeah. good drought tolerant Bermuda grass. And then Oklahoma State has always been in the market for breeding cold tolerant Bermuda grasses. And they also got, so, so they, they tried to, you know, one up the Tiff Tough guys by putting cold tolerance in there. And so that's where Tahoma came out of. So Tahoma is a little cold and a little drought. 
Tahoma is very, very cold tolerant. It's the most cold tolerant Bermuda okay. grass. Well, I'll come. I'll come back to that. I want to. I want to stay at uh, thirty thousand feet for a little bit. Yeah. But so this. So I mean, and I and I'm going to ask stupid questions, especially for those guys that understand this. The difference between these kind of grasses and the ultra dwarf. What's share us? You know, help me understand that a little bit better. So ultra dwarfs are. Ex uh, that's. Let's see. How would I? Be but, careful. <laughs> yeah. Ultra dwarfs are really just for greens, I would yeah. say. And I think most of those guys would tell you that, like Champion and Tiff Eagle guys and Mini Verde and, the, and those that have done so well on greens. If you put that on a fairway or a tee or something like that, they're probably going to get real puffy and, and, uh, right. Take a lot of water. That's just my anyway. guess. I've never seen that, but. So they're they're uh, so it, it's it's more like a bent grass than it would be like a Bermuda grass, whereas the 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 other grasses it can tolerate more more wear and tear. Yes, and most of those ultra dwarfs do not have very much cold tolerance at all, and that's why when you know they're bringing them up here to like Richmond, Virginia, and some places up here yeah. in the upper transition zone, they have to really be careful. They have to cover, you know, at twenty five degrees. Uh, and things like that. So if you talk to those turf managers, they're real cautious about, uh, you know, cold weather and covering and, and all of that stuff and not trying not to lose anything. Yeah. So that's why the breeding happened was because uh, it started out as a water tolerant or as a water management tool. That's what I understand. Yeah. yeah. The USGA, USGA got together and they're still doing that today. Some of these new, uh, you know, we're going to have new grasses in 10 or 15 years probably. And they're going to be really, really good. As they won't as need water at all, I hope. Because yeah, there won't be any water. So. Maybe yeah. so. That's what they're after, you know. Yeah. And they want to push these things into the Mountain West. Uh, Denver, Colorado, you know, think of, think of how bad water is out west in yeah. Salt Lake City and Denver, Colorado and, and Aurora, Colorado and places like that. You know, they're trying to pull turf grass out of people's lawns. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No doubt. To outlaw it in Aurora. And so we've got we've got people out there that are trying to replace that and say, hey, Bermuda is a good replacement for that. Let's let's put it in. Let's save water and still have, you know, let people have a lawn or a backyard or something. Wasn't that part? I mean, I don't you probably won't remember this because you're too young, but I remember back and it might even go back into the 60s when the, the little you know insert in the newspaper would promote zoysia grass in your home lawn. And it was a disaster. It was, you know, the older varieties. But the, I think even back then, the the, the uh, suggestion was was water management. Yeah, and um, yeah. I mean, you know, we just did a podcast. Kevin Hicks just did a podcast uh, where he really talked, uh, you know, he talked to the regional USGA um, uh, rep and um, and and we he, he talked a lot about water. He, he'd been at a water a summit and out west water is everything. I mean, these guys are spending well over a million dollars in their budget for just water. Uh, and uh, and it's becoming, you know, less quality, uh, less available. Uh, so what we're, we're what we're doing here right now is starting to really breed in some of these water resistant. So when you say water resistant, and we'll use Tahoma as the example that we'll get into here in a minute, but not uh, water resistant, but drought but I, I, drought resistant. So yeah. theoretically, using less water is that the plan? Yep. So what if you were to take this out into really a environment where water is is managed? How much are we talking about? I mean, what kind of percentage? reduction can we really say from some of these breeding programs i mean over a blue well if you think about this you can take a bluegrass uh, versus a bermuda grass here in virginia and i'm just going to use the state that i live in and perfect locality but you can shut off the water for bermuda grass you do not need it you know water now if you want to keep it green obviously you need to water it a little bit yeah but you can shut off the water for your Bermuda grass. You cannot do that for bluegrass or fescue. Yeah, um, you'll lose it. Exactly. Bermuda grass, obviously, we know will go dormant. It'll turn a little bit khaki brown, and the first rain will bring it right back, and it'll be beautiful and green. Yeah. Um, bluegrass, not so much. Fescue, definitely not. What's it look like in the heat of the summer when it's dormant? Bermuda grass? Yeah. Beautiful. Looks just like it does in the winter. It's just it's brown. a bit khaki brown and yeah. it doesn't always go completely khaki brown some of these new ones like tahoma and then i'll use that one in in tiff tough 
they're very good about uh, avoiding drought or having you know having a really good deep root system. Tiff Tuff has an amazing root system. Yeah. It'll avoid drought. Uh, Tahoma is a little bit differently. It just uses less water. Doesn't have quite the root system that that Tiff Tuff does. So but, if you had a if you had a Bermuda, or we'll use Tahoma as the example here because that's what we're going to talk about. But if I have Tahoma in my front yard in Virginia and it's droughty, and uh, can I use less water and keep it green through the summer month as opposed to letting it just die and like bluegrass might do? Absolutely. I think you could use probably 50%. I don't have any. Uh, you can see I'm trying to pin you down to a number, right? Yeah, I know you are. I know you are. <laughs> Sorry. And, and I'll throw out the 50% less, but you know, color is, is subjective. Yeah. Quality is subjective. It's just what, uh, it's what is going to please the homeowner or please right. the turf manager or whatever, uh, how much wa less water they can use to keep something that's acceptable for them. So that's right. Right. That's really, you know, hard to pin down for me. But if it were me, I think I could use 50% less water. You know? Well, that's huge, especially in parts of the country. And with this conversation, I mean, um, you know, you, you we all know that, you know, places like the Colorado River are gone. But and it was interesting listening to Kevin's uh, podcast a couple of weeks ago where he talked about, uh, you know, talked about water issues. But, you know, so we're, we're pushing and I'm going to just steal that percentage from you for lot for sake of argument and it may may or not be quite that big but will it get better do you think will breeding i, I mean it it's got to get better because we have to deal with water management in our industry i think it will i think it'll get better there's stuff coming down the pike right now that's in testing that is going to be better than anything we've got out there right now you know good uh, yeah better root systems and better efficiencies and things like that and you know, it's, I think that 50% is too far off, Joel, because if you think about good. I water uh, an inch a week on my Kentucky bluegrass lawn, um, and I can get away with half an inch a week on Bermuda grass just to keep it an acceptable level of color and quality. Yeah. That's and that's going to change the acceptance level is going to change, I think, as people realize, or more importantly, especially us on the East Coast that start getting billed for water and uh, oh. realize that this stuff is bloody expensive. I mean, like I said, out in, you know, California, West coast, you know, water is bloody expensive. That's why you're seeing all these uh, folks, you know, pulling their lawn out and, and going to rocks and, and cactus. And, and, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. it's kind of, kind of not very attractive, at least for those of us in the turf industry. Let me talk about this too. You're seeing Bermuda grass going North. Uh, I mean, you didn't see, you know, when you were at TPC, was there, you know, anybody really around that had any kind of warm season grass? There was a few places. I mean, you know, Woodlock had some zoysia and um, there's a couple of Bermuda fair, uh, fairways in the area. But, you know, now it's starting to really creep in and more people are saying, hey, you know, maybe it's time to, you know, change this out. I mean, they can tolerate that weather in the winter a little bit better. And, uh, you know, and it's it's becoming more popular talking about it. It's really becoming more popular. We see that a lot around the mid-Atlantic where people are starting to change out yeah. bent grass and, and things like that and doing, uh, you know, some of these newer grasses. These newer grasses look just like Bermuda. You know, when they're mowed yeah, down, they do. They can mowed down uh, really, really tight. Um, and they look, they give a good, dense, playable surface. Yeah. yeah. The only thing they don't have is the color in the winter and everything goes dormant. I mean, when I had bent grass fairways, those bent grass fairways went khaki brown and and of course. Uh, timber and stayed khaki brown until uh, you know probably I don't know late February or something yeah. like that. We got a warm stretch, but of course once you start putting the earthworks down, it would go dormant later and warm warm up. But I don't want to talk about that. But <laughs> there you, go. you know, one of the things that we're seeing too is sports turf complexes. I mean, uh, Tony Leonard at the Eagles uh, has now a Bermuda base. I know you work with Travis Hogan at Kansas City, which is a transition zone. He's got Tahoma. Hey, Tony's, his Tony's Tony's my guy, and then uh, Sean up at, at the Ravens. And... At the Ravens. Okay, sorry. Uh, but but now we're seeing Bermuda going into Soldier Field and and in Chicago. I mean, it's it's really you know starting to change. I mean, of course, sports turf, and we can talk about this. But sports turf guys are using it more as the base. Tony uses it as his base. But I got to tell you, man, as much as I hated that football game uh, a couple of weeks. <laughs> 
Buffalo, the Giants Eagles, the field looked fantastic. I mean, Tony's mm-hmm. field always, I mean, in the middle of January, uh, we're watching a god awful game where my Giants got their butts kicked by the Eagles. Uh, and um, and I don't know when this is gonna air, so we might even be past Super Bowl when you hear this. But the field in January looked great, and uh, you know, and and that was really you know, uh, I mean, it's it's quite a testament to what these guys can do, but there's a lot of grass involved in this, too. I mean, they're using, you know, they're using these Bermudas as their base, getting better footing. You know, the players are thrilled that we've got grass in January, as opposed to turf, plastic. You know, I mean, it's fantastic what we're going to. It It is amazing, the science that these guys are doing now. Yeah. Um, so Tony's using the Tahoma as a base, and then they're getting, uh, like, he is specking uh seed for i think it's mountain view seed if i'm not not it is yeah and it's uh, he's specking it based on seed size so he can get more i didn't know that yeah he's they're doing some some crazy stuff that uh yeah we've had tony on the podcast here you know worked with tony for a long time but yeah i mean what like i said i just you know i just throw uh, accolades left and right because the field looks so good uh, you're gonna start rooting for the eagles now I might have to, yeah. Well, actually, I'm not allowed to by virtue of uh, of marriage, but uh, okay. the whole it's a long story we won't talk about. But uh, that's, that's uh, and and you know it's funny. My my folks, I grew up in in, in uh, Pennsylvania, in, in Malvern, Pennsylvania, and my both my parents were vi- were avid uh, Eagles fans. So uh, I I you know I, obviously it's they're a hell of a team this year, but. I don't care about football as much as I care about the field. So I yeah. looked at his field. I looked at, you know, Kansas city's field. They look great. And, uh, but to see Bermuda grass going up into soldier field in, in, you know, and, and they've been getting snow since September or something. I had some ridiculous environment that you would never have dreamt to see Bermuda grass, but, you know, uh, and I don't know what they're doing and, and you may, may or may not as well, but the fact that, you know, we're now able to have this conversation about Bermuda, uh, moving north uh, with the varieties that you guys are uh, starting to really see is pretty fascinating to me. It is. And some of the, the colleges up there, Purdue, I think has. Uh, yep. Yep. Grass. And, and a lot of those Midwestern play uh, Midwestern schools and sports facilities up there, um, you know, putting Bermuda grass in something we didn't see 10, 15 years ago, really. Not at all. So are you seeing Bermuda grass going into home lawns? Oh yeah, Definitely. In Virginia, where you are? In Virginia. We're starting to do a lot of warm season grass in home lawns, especially down in uh, Virginia Beach area, Chesapeake, and things like that. Yeah. How far north? In Richmond. Not not so much uh, in Richmond. You know, everybody still likes that cool season look, that fescue yeah. look. Bluegrass fescue, yeah. But golf courses and sports fields are coming around. They're seeing, uh, you know, dividends being paid and reduced fungicides and reduced water usage and things like that. So, and, and increased traffic, uh, traffic recuperation ability. Yeah. So it recovers a little bit quicker. Um, are you seeing uh, Bermudas coming into uh, lawns North? Are they, is that a potential down the road? I think it is potential down the road, especially in areas where water becomes an issue, you know, and and water's going to ultimately become an issue everywhere. I mean, at at some point, somebody's going to figure out, oh, first of all, I can make money on this. And secondly, you know, there has to be levels of restriction. Yeah. You know, we just have to be able to figure out how to manage, you know, maintain water uh, without it just being, you know, and and you know, it's funny, one of the things that Kevin Hicks, and I'm going to reiterate this, talked about on his podcast is, you know, the first thing we got to do is figure out how to get moisture sensors on these irrigation systems. So you don't drive down the road and see, you know, Mr. Jones, watering his lawn in the middle of a rainstorm you know it's just it just it's just it's the whole thing is so broken uh but i think it'll all get better let's let's talk specifically now about tahoma because that's really your baby you yeah. are um so what's the you, you are the licensing uh, tell me how that works for you guys uh, legally we are the Bruce. licensing and marketing arm for tahoma 31 uh the new bermuda grass it's been a been out about five years now. I think we got it in 2018 here in Virginia and we started selling it. Um, but we have 31 growers across the United States. We have nine international growers, actually oh, probably wow. more than that. Uh, right now we have quite a few in Australia that I'm not, uh, that I know that we have a co-op in Australia and it's, there's probably up to nine in Australia that eventually will grow it. And then grow have- it and then sell. And then, so that'll spread the the usage 
Actually. Love it. Yeah. So where's Tahoma from? Is that Oklahoma State? Oklahoma State, yeah. Okay. Dr. Yan Shi Wu uh, developed that stuff. Oh, there you go. Uh, what, what Do you know the parents? So one of the parents came out of China. Uh, he actually brought it back. It's a, uh, I think it was, a, it was a common, it was a common type that he found up in like the Gobi desert at 10,000 feet elevation or something. Oh, really? So he selected he it. it. So he knew yeah. it had cold tolerance and he knew right, it right. had cold tolerance because it's a cold, dry desert in Northwest China. And he yeah. brought the parent back as, as plant material. And then he bred it to a transvalensis that was out of South Africa. And so the two of those, he, you know, he, he came up with 10,000 progeny and they, he told me the story, how they just picked through everything and they were looking for uh, color and texture and, and root density and, you know, all of these different things. And they just discarded, discarded, discarded for like a year. And then they came up with about 80, 80 plants and they put those 80 plants in the ground and the first year they put those 80 plants in the ground, they had a horrible winter. In oh, great. Great, great testing, but a horrible winter in still water. And only like a few, a handful of those things came out of the winter. And one of them was the 31st plant. And the 31st plant that came out, you know, they were all numbered one through 88 or something like yeah. that. And number 31 ended up being Tahoma. Is so, Tahoma numbered or is it just Tahoma? It's Tahoma 31. It is Tahoma. That's why I thought. I, I, I only call it Tahoma, but I guess because I, I just decided to skip to 31. But that's where the 31 people, came yeah, from. A lot of people do that, but that's where the 31 came from. Yeah. It was the 31st plant in the in the test that year. And what they, happened to all the other plants? Did they all just throw them out? Them I think they took about four or five of them that lived, and they put them in the NTEP trials. And then out of the NTEP trials, Tahoma ex excelled. It was yeah. one of the, I think it was tied with number one with Tiff Tough in that trial, which was 2013 through 2018. And then they released it to us at the end of that trial, 2018. So. Where did the name Tahoma come from? Tahoma came, it's an Indian word. We researched names like crazy, and it's an Indian word from, I think, Northwest Washington, and it means frozen water. And oh, in, really? the, in that logo, T Tahoma was so cold tolerant that in the logo, we put a snowflake, if you've ever looked that hard. Oh, I think I have. Well, I think I have, but I, yeah, that slips in my mind right now. It's funny. I was talking to the guys at Georgia about Tiff Tough, and they said they spent uh, like 60 grand on a marketing company and they came up with Tiff Tough. And they all said, it's the stupidest name I've ever heard. It's a nice grass. I see it a lot on sports fields. Uh, nice. and, and, and the guys love it, but, uh, it's a silly name. I like the name Tahoma and then, uh, now, now I like it even more having heard that uh, thing. So let's talk about Tahoma. It was designed specifically for cold tolerance, cold tolerance and drought tolerance. Yes, sir. Both. Okay. So you're really looking at both it, it, one way heavier than the other drought or cold. Um, well, they were looking for, to breed a cold tolerant, drought tolerant grass and, and, uh, Tahoma excels at cold tolerance. It is very good at drought tolerance. It's not quite as good as Tiff Tough. I, I would rank it number two. It's got okay. a, it's got a high efficiency as far as water usage is concerned. You know. So when we were talking about fifty percent decrease in water, is, is Tahoma in that game? Yeah, oh, definitely. All right. So you can. So it's still going to be part of this conversation for a long time. Where is it being used? Uh, obviously, sports fields because Tony's got it at the Eagles and a bunch of other fields that we know. But uh, where is it being used in the golf course? On the golf course, everywhere, tees, fairways, uh, collars, and greens. I, I, I don't know if you want me to go and say some of the clubs it's at, but I, I can if you want me to. I, I'd be fine with that. I, it's an you know, open forum. <laughs> I mean, you, you got it all, you've got it all over. I mean, I've seen it all over. I, I didn't realize as much on greens, but is, is it becoming a popular greens grass? No, not as much. It's it's not great for greens. I, in my opinion, it's uh it's going to be a little slow and a little bit grainy, but it does have the density to where you can put it on a green. You can spray uh, Primo on it once a week and kind of get it tight. You can mow it an eighth of an inch and probably even a tenth of an inch. So um, oh, so you can so Tahoma you can really take down. You can really take down. We've got right. it on. It's in the if you go and look at the NTEP uh, greens trials, it's in there and it does pretty well. Yeah. Talk uh, about the NTEP trial with Tahoma. What 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 were they saying? I mean, I know it's highly rated. Um, what's the actual report on the NTEP that it compares to everybody else? Well, it's it's typically in the top 
ten percent of all the grasses that yeah. are in the trial. And it's in a couple. It's in the drought study. It's in so the NTEP is broken down into regular NTEP, which is kind of like a beauty pageant for turf. Right, color mostly. And then you've got the drought study, and then yeah. you've got the green study. And so it's in all three of those, and it does well in all of them. So the cold tolerance is relatively new, and or is it in NTEP? Uh, I mean, it's certainly getting more popularity now because obviously these grasses are starting to head north. Well, so the way NTEP is broke down, they have about 19 or 20 universities across the nation that that do NTEP or that participate in it. And so some of the ones like in Kentucky, uh, I think UT Knoxville, uh, Purdue, obviously participate in that cold study. And so that's where Tahoma excels in those places. And you can kind of see, so they do some winter kill studies at those schools. Oh, really? Oh, that's cool. So trying to really push it to the fullest. Yeah, trying to see where it will live and, and you know what it does in those places. And so, Tom did really well up in like places like uh, Purdue, you know, which is can be pretty nasty winters. I mean, that can be pretty ugly up there. That's only a couple hours south of Chicago. And no, I know. Why, and that's why we think it'll do fairly well in some of those sports fields and even some of those golf courses in in the northern transition zone and southern. Yeah like Southern Ohio, even we've got to home on some golf courses in Southern. It Ohio. just amazes me that we're talking about Bermuda grass in Southern Ohio and sure. Purdue. Sure. 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 Yeah. Sure. yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you know what, uh, Chicago, what soldier field is using? It's I, I don't Tahoma. think, is it Tahoma? It's wow. Right. So you're getting around there, dude. Yeah. I'm quite impressed. So, so what do, what are the guys telling me? What, I mean, I I've talked to Tony about it, but what do you you know? What are they telling you about this grass? Why are they why are they going to Homa? It's great for wear and recuperation. I was just talking to the other day at the sports uh, sports turf guy uh, from Purdue, and he was telling me about their field. And he said, you know, we've never had a perfect field before until this year. We put Tahoma in there, and that field just looks amazing. The coaches were even commenting on that the quality wow. of that field. But he can just you know really recuperate it quickly. It it it'll get beat up and then they can push it, you know, a little bit of nitrogen or fertility or whatever and get it right back where it needs to be. This uh, was football you're talking? Yeah. Football. Yeah. Are you get your, I assume you're getting it on other sports fields as well. Soccer fields, baseball fields. Yeah. We've got the lacrosse. The, Did lacrosse. You know? All purpose. A couple of lacrosse places up in Baltimore. Yeah. Private schools with, uh, I would think so. I would think so. So what's the deal with the rooting? It's just got great rooting. It it holds itself in really, really well. Um, you don't get a lot of divoting on soccer fields. That's one comment that we you know, So it holds. Holds really, really yeah. well. Um everybody that that is using it for sports is is just loving it for the uh it's it's a very I don't know if you've seen it, Joel, but I it's have. it's a very dense grass. Yep. Um it's got great rooting, so it holds itself together. Uh, you don't get a lot of divoting and when people you know kickers kick and linemen push up push off they're not it's not tearing and breaking apart like some of the stuff that we is it there. grabbing their players feet i mean is it holding them or are they no, able to break free so it's it's yeah, obviously beaten uh plastic which we hate yeah in the turf industry. Than fake turf but yeah I mean, that's the big, I mean, you know, it's funny because you're seeing more and more uh, professional players coming out and saying, we want, we want grass instead right. of plastic, you know? And, and it's funny that, you know, I, the first time I started really, you know, seeing this was on, on, you know, the guys that were playing on fields like Tony's uh, you know, like uh, Travis uh, Hogan's down in Kansas city and, and uh, you know, and these, these newer type uh, Bermuda grasses and, you know, you know, and what they're doing with these things. I mean, the fact that these guys have such a brilliant looking field in the middle of January for playoffs is just blows your mind. And just, you, I, I just, you know, I watch these silly games. And I just stare at the fields like this is great. You know, unfortunately, uh, my team sucks, but that's a whole different battle altogether. Uh, is it easy enough to airify through? Can you can you get in there if you need to poke it? Yeah, not not a problem at all. Airification is not a problem. Vert cutting, um, you know, and uh, that so they they're putting this stuff on infields and in baseball. We've got I don't know three or four. Uh, in fields they're about to put it on the cardinals i think very very soon in st louis 
the Dodgers or Tahoma, the California Dodgers in LA. Yeah, California. Well, that's semi-arid, so I guess that's an okay. Yeah, that's, area. and that's a warm place and West Coast. Yeah, turf, yeah. yeah. I always think of California as being you know more northern, but yeah, that makes sense. Uh, what, talk to me about um, disease pressure. What you the spring programs, fertility. Uh, how do they differ from some of the cool season grasses? So, well, let's talk about disease. So mostly all these Bermuda grasses are going to have a little bit of large, large patch every now and yeah. then in the spring, especially around say March when it's cool and it's cloudy and, and uh, they're not getting, they're not growing really yet, but they're starting to green up. You'll see a little bit of large patch. So you might want to spray a fungicide at that time of year, just to kind of prevent large patch. Um, I haven't seen it so much in Tahoma. I've seen it in, in some of the newer grasses, um, but I think it, they're all susceptible to that at that time of year. Yeah, that makes just, sense. Just makes sense. And then um, as far as uh, okay. other like spring dead spot, a lot of these newer cold tolerant grasses do not, they don't show the symptoms of the old 419 as far as spring dead, dead spot is concerned. I haven't seen it on Northbridge. I haven't seen it on Tiff Tough or Tahoma. So a lot of those seem to be, you know, doing better as far as spring dead spot is concerned. But Good. there's always that possibility that after a grass is 10 or 15 years old, you'll start to see some of that and you want to put down, uh, you know, something in the fall to prevent that. Are any of these new newer varieties um, uh, derived from 419? I mean, you're, you're Tahoma clearly isn't, but I wouldn't think 419's in the in the run anywhere anymore, right? 419 is still around. It's, no, but in terms of parent material, it's not part of it's not a parent material for any of these newer breeding. Oh, it, it can't be a parent. No, it's it's sterile, so it can't be a parent. Oh, material. well, that explains that, and that shows my ignorance once again. That's uh, something I like to show off when I can. Uh, <laughs> sure. But what about fertility? I mean, are, how do they compare in fertility from? Um, from cool season from cool season yeah well, i think you can do a lot less uh fertility on a bermuda grass i think yeah, you, you know you know i don't like to hear that right <laughs> i mean you know just from a nitrogen standpoint no, i'm kidding yeah but, but yeah but good ideal more nitrogen on bermuda grass you know bermuda grass will respond a lot better to night it's just got more roots and it can mine the soil for nutrients better and yeah. it grows quicker you know and all that stuff uh, so it's going to recuperate a lot faster yeah. than if you had a bluegrass out there you can't you just can't put uh you know a ton of nitrogen on yeah them. you know it's funny we we have found and we didn't know this of course we started in the northeast as cool season but you know what with what we're doing with uh, biological soil management feeding the soil we've really done we've really learned an awful lot about these warm season grasses and we work really well with them because like you said they don't need a lot of fertility uh but they do like having a, a well-managed you know soil uh, especially, you know, I mean, I love to home and I, you know, love some of these newer varieties that get really good rooting and, you know, and, and what we do is we help digest that rooting. So it's not just this huge matted thatchy, miserable thing. How do these grasses typically do in high nitrogen environments? Do they thatch up fairly quickly? They can. Yes. Yeah. Anytime you over, over applied nitrogen fertilizer, you can expect some, some rapid growth, yeah. any Bermuda grass. And I'll tell you, a little carbon in that program and a lot less ni soluble nitrogen is, uh, it's really magic with these grasses. And and we've really been enjoying it. You know, I've seen a lot of Tahoma out there and I've seen, you know, I've seen a lot of Northbridge. Uh, like I said, I see a lot of Tiff Tough on sports fields and I, and the guys, we do a lot of work. We've had, um, um, we've had the guys on from FC Dallas and they have Tiff Tough there. They love it. Uh, but you're right. It's a, you know, it's a higher cut grass that, you know, that of course they're playing soccer on it. So they're not, they're not cutting it at an eighth of an inch. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, these, you know, it's been wonderful for them. The color, the recovery that, you know, of course they're in, in Texas. So it's not quite what we're looking at in a transition, but these are some of the things that we're seeing, isn't it? With these, Absolutely. I mean, it's just, how, how do, I mean, I know I don't want to put you up against your competition, but um, I mean, let me give you a chance to to brag a little bit. How how do you compare to an iron cutter or a North Bridge, some of the newer uh, varieties? Well, iron cutter, I really can't speak too much about because I don't know a lot about it. Yeah. It's, it's just coming out, right? Really, yeah, now. relatively new. And uh, Adam does a great job with yep. uh, iron cutter. So 
I, d I can't speak to that one too much other than it's a beautiful grass. I've seen it. It's, it's, you know, I've seen it in trays and it looks beautiful. Yeah. I've not seen it on a field yet though. They've got some fields with it. There's, there's a handful. It's yep. coming. Yeah, it's definitely coming. Northbridge, um, Northbridge is a great grass. You know, it's a little different than Tahoma. You know, people always ask me that, well, what, what makes those two different? Um, Tahoma is, I think, a lot more coal tolerant than Northbridge. I don't know about a lot more. That may be a, a stretch of it. But it's more. That's that's what you're. Yeah. That's how you're promoting it. More coal tolerant. It's yeah. a, Tahoma is a uh, lower growing grass. It's very low and I'd say very dense um, compared to Northbridge. It's a little bit more vertical. Um, people, you know, one of the complaints we always hear about Tahoma is they it doesn't grow vertically enough. You know that people will tell you that and they're really like, yeah, just can't get any. Uh, it's like a, they feel like they have to mow clippings off of it. And I'm like, well, that's a good thing. But uh, that is one of the biggest complaints about Tahoma is that it just doesn't grow vertically enough. It's a more of a horizontal grower. And if yeah. you see it, if you see it in a tray or a uh, like a pot, which they'll, they'll do in the greenhouses and things like that, it'll grow horizontally more and out of the tray versus up where you'll see Northbridge and, and Latitude and Tiff Tough and all the other oh, grass going the other way. Yeah. A little bit more vertical. You know, I've seen, I've seen a lot of people, including some folks we've already talked about that have left Northbridge in the North, you know, in, you know, in the mid Atlantic and North going to Tahoma. Is that because of cold tolerance? Yes. Almost. Yeah. Almost. Okay. So yeah. that's really one, that's one of the things that you're really uh, touting about this. Yeah. And it will just, I don't know if it's just the cold tolerance too. It's got probably, uh, it, I, you know, like we were talking about with the horizontal growth and the yeah. you know, where, you know, Tahoma's very, very good at wear uh, tolerance and recuperation from traffic stress and, right. and, and being able to respond quickly uh, to traffic, you know, and things like that. And I think that is what some of these sports field managers are seeing. We've got guys in Montgomery County, Maryland that, Yes, you know, I know. Yeah, they were. We've had on the podcast actually. How quickly <laughs> that they can uh, recuperate a soccer, yeah. field, goal mouse, and things like that. You know. Yeah, that's why I asked you about lacrosse. Is because the goal mouth on lacrosse, I think, is probably the hardest place to grow grass in the free world. But there's no um, doubt about that. It's like yeah. three point basketball on grass. Right. Exactly. It's exactly what. It, how easy is it to uh, oversee Tahoma? Is it take it easily? So I'm going to tell you this. Some people say that Tahoma is difficult to oversee, but I think it's uh, we've we've had good success with it. And this is why. And so as a golf course superintendent, when I would oversee the Bermuda grass fairway at like Kingsville, um, I was always having to triple X primo rate on the Bermuda grass fairway before I put the seed down, then drop seed. And then kind of wait for, you know, I always felt like I had to wait for a rain before I started watering. So I'd wait for a good rain event to pound that seed down into Soak that. it in. Yeah, to pound it down into that canopy. Mm -hmm. That mechanical action of those raindrops really helps. Yeah. Uh, I'll give Mike Goatley credit for that at Virginia Tech. Um, Fair. But, but so I'd wait for that rain event and then I would begin my watering regimen. And so we yeah. water and keep everything moist after that that and always get a you know a, a pretty good catch but in that time frame the bermuda grass would start to elevate and start to grow vertically like we were talking about right and then so it will actually outgrow if it starts coming out of regulation it'll start to outgrow those seedlings and get above those seedlings and start to shade them out and so i think tahoma actually does a better job at because it stays short you can mow it at half an inch and three weeks later it still looks like it's at half an inch it it doesn't it allows those seedlings to get up and above the canopy and uh and start to you know get sunlight and photosynthesize wow. and stuff like that so that's my take on on uh overseeding with tahoma and there you go. I can tell you if you think it it's difficult to oversee, just look at the Philadelphia Eagles stadium because they <laughs> yes, I think you can use that as a good example. That's some of yeah. the best seeing I've seen. So, so what you're saying is that if you have Tahoma, your your team will go to the uh, playoffs and maybe the Super Bowl. 
I don't say that. Okay, well, you could. It sounds like it. You know, it's it's a good shot at this point. But uh, hey, I got to thank you very much uh, for for all your time and for sharing us some ideas on some of these newer grasses. Anything uh, anything that you're allowed to talk about that might be coming down the pike? Uh, yeah, it sounds like you guys are always working and and looking to have uh, the next Tahoma. Yeah, we we've got some some good stuff coming down the pike. I can't really divulge. All right, it. I, I was kind of hoping to pull something out. Yeah, uh, yeah. you you at you're at all the trade shows, so we'll see you. Uh, this might this might air after the show, but at the GIS. Um, but uh, you know, and I get I it's kind of neat to run into you. But you know, I, I like I said, I travel the country, and Tahoma has certainly been a big conversation. So when I saw you last week at the STMA, I thought it'd be a good conversation to have and. And I appreciate your time. It's now time for you to turn around and start, you know, playing with. Uh, there's about about 400 bottles behind you up there. Is it? It's Which quite the stock. Looks like a. I hit now. I was gonna say it looks like a production bar for God's sake. Yeah. Is it mostly bourbon? Is this middle shelf bourbon? Uh, the middle shelf is a little bit of everything, and the bottom shelf is just all you know. That's your big, the big, big bottles. There you go. Love it. Love it. Hey, uh, Chad, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Uh, we will see you at the next uh, stop. Uh, and uh, I wish you guys the best of luck. Uh, keep up the good work. You know, I think, you know, I think you guys are starting to really change, uh, change the way people think about uh, grasses these days. And, and it's important. So, uh, you know, and again, with water being, you know, one of the biggest issues that we got, it's, it's a conversation that has to be had. So thank you, sir. Appreciate it. And that my friends is the earthworks podcast. If you're not a subscriber, Please subscribe so we can send you information on uh, cool conversations like we had with Mr. Adcock today. And we will be back next week with somebody else here on the Earthworks podcast. Thank you very much. <laughs>